My name is Savi Anandan. I am the product manager for Spring Cloud Dataflow, and I have the privilege to co-present this talk topic with Sobi. I am Sobi Chako. I, I am also in the Spring Cloud Dataflow team, working mainly on the Spring Cloud Stream and the Kafka Binder, uh, Kafka Streams Binder side of things. So it's my privilege to work. <laughs> to speak with All you. right, very cool. So yeah, so today we have this topic: building cloud-native data and intensive applications with Spring. Uh, there's a lot of buzzwords here. Uh, but Sobi and I did uh, come up with a storyline to hopefully unpack all this for you. So let's get, get this thing started. But yeah, before we proceed, and I guess you, have, you might have seen this slide many times, uh, we have to show it. So whatever we're going to share here, uh, we are just like uh, showed in the interest of uh, sharing it to the community. So it's no guarantee that it's going to be part of uh, any of the released artifact from Pivotal. So let's leave it at there. So today we have agenda, so I want to start with uh, what, what events mean in, in the context of enterprise. Uh, I want to also bring in some interconnection between events and what it means for data and intensive applications. So hopefully also define what that means for enterprise and maybe for your project in your team and so on. And then we have this practical take on how someone would go about building that type of application. So we have this incremental set of demos. Uh, we have about three of them, so hopefully uh, we'll try and share some of the perspective uh, that, that, that we, we can solve with some of the spring projects uh, while we are at it. So I want to start with this one slide. So this is, uh, uh, this is about Uber. Everybody's familiar with Uber, right? Uh, this is a tech company who, have, uh, who has built their business from the ground up based on data and technology. Uh, some of the statistics that I uh, came across one of the articles recently, uh, they perform about 15 million rides per day. They operate over 78 different <coughs> countries, right? And they have, they have like 3 million drivers at a given point in time, so that's, it's pretty massive scale. It's a lot of, lot of information, a lot of big data sets, right? But then if you think about all these events and all this different data at, at, at real time, uh, but it comes down to, in my opinion, it all is like Uber is trying to deliver more meaningful value to their customers, and the, ultimately they want profound uh, customer engagement. So people who are using their platform, they want to engage with them in a more meaningful way. So let's, let's see an example. So who here has used Uber Pool? All right, it's about 30, 40%. So Uber Pool is a product and service. You just open up your mobile phone. You just select that as an option. Uh, Uber as a platform as a service. Uh, the behind the scene, they do all this real-time matching. They provide all this efficient drop and pickup information. And obviously, it's more economical uh, for users to use. But from customer's perspective, the first customer that Uber has in their platform is the drivers, right? So the drivers are the ones uh, who are constantly getting uh, these notifications about all these ride opportunities. So they get a lot more ride opportunities, and they get more income, more tips. So they are directly engaging with Uber as a platform and uh, getting more benefit for their day-to-day -day living. And likewise, on the other side, the other set of customers on the, on the Uber platform are the passengers, which is you and me. Right? So we are choosing that as a product and service because it's convenient, it's very flexible. Uh, and you, have, uh, you, you obviously can, uh, can benefit from it because it's cost so much less. And I've used it many times and it's about 50% less than if I were to ride solo. It works out really great. So go back uh, in, into the previous slide that I was talking about. Uh, in this scenario where which two different customers are directly engaging with Uber as a platform, but Uber on the other hand likes trying to deliver, deliver meaningful uh, value adds, and so that these customers can engage in their platform, and they can continue to use and you know, continue to operate and use, and so everybody wins at the end of the day. So I thought it was a, a reasonable example to share at the begin, uh, begin, uh, beginning of the stock. But then when you operate that type of system, uh, like Uber, for, for, for example, to build that type of a platform, it's, it's real-time streaming analytics right behind the scene. Uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, challenges in reality. Like, for example, there's unpredictable traffic patterns. Uh, you know, you, you probably might have heard about search pricing that Uber has. It's, it's a business model. They make revenue out of it, but, but it's, it's, it's a given thing in a production setup. And there's resource contention. You probably have this application running in a container, but it's out of capacity. So what happens if CPU maxes out or memory maxes out? How do you handle that type of failure? And then the faults, right? I mean, apps crash all the time in production. How do you recover from that? And obviously, slow processing. For example, if you have connected, uh, Uber has connected a driver with a passenger, and, and the, driver, the passenger is waiting like for 20, 30 minutes, it's just it's pointless. It's a really bad experience for that customer, uh, so they have to be really careful about it. And ordering is another important thing. Like, for example, again, the bidirectionality happening between a driver and a passenger in Uber's platform, 
Uh, and if, if, if the driver is stacked to a passenger, and at the end of the day, the, uh, the, the driver that ends up reaching to pick up the passenger is different, that's it's completely wrong, right? It's confusing for the user. So it's going to be another uh, big challenge for over, like platforms. And rewind and replay, again, if app crashes, what happens if, if the state needs to be retained? How do we recover from that failure and go back in history and then like, make sure still the, uh, the driver and the passengers are connected, connected the same way? So that's another in interesting challenge for any streaming platforms, right? And so you can apply this types of, uh, you can apply and foresee this type of challenges for any of your streaming use cases. But then going back to Uber again, uh, so imagine about 15 million rights per day, right? I mean, there are several subsystems that's tapping into this data. Several million more uh, messages and events are happening in real time. And it's going to be a lot of different, uh, a different set of challenges that Uber as a platform needs to go through. And having to go through the challenges that we see on the left side and, and reasoning through all this and still be able to operate the system in a more uh, highly scalable and a more robust and resilient way is a really big, big problem. And that's what really getting into those four categories that I, that I have in this slide on the right. Uh, so Uber has system, like systems, should probably think about reliably running these types of apps and be able to auto scale up and down depending on the throughput uh, uh, traffic patterns. And, and be able to like, fix something in real time, be able to rolling upgrade, roll back as necessary, and obviously be able to port your application logic from one environment to another environment all the way to production uh, without impacting your upstream and downstream consumers. <clears throat> so given all those challenges, uh, in fact, Martin Kleppman uh, in his book, Designing, for data, design, uh, Designing Data and of Application book, uh, he specifically talks about these four categories in fact, he calls it an application data intensive. If the, applica the, the core problem of this application is data, uh, the data being quantity, the data probably is really complex, and probably uh, the data is changing in a, in, a, in a varying speed. How do you deal with all these this types of patterns and still be able to like, operate and reliably execute this application and the business logic at, at, at runtime? So to, to dumb it down a little bit, I just make it a little bit more simpler, I, I brought in, a, I want to share another analogy. So there is this video, it's, it's playing in an infinite loop. Uh, but if you notice, you know, hopefully people in the back can see it. If you notice there are some patterns happening in this video, uh, think about your data that's happening within your project or within your teams or probably in your company. Uh, and see, uh, in a, try and relate that to the, the thing that you see in this video. Like for example, here vehicles are moving in varying speed. Vehicles are of different sizes and shapes. Vehicles are of different colors, right? Some are going linear A to B, and some are making a turn and forking out, or maybe exiting out of freeway or entering into a freeway and things like that. You probably have a similar thing in your enterprise, too. You probably have data from different sources and different destinations. And you probably have data of different types. Some are structured, some are unstructured. And you have data with varying speed. Some are real-time data. You probably want to do some streaming, streaming analytics. Some are really more offline uh, batch processing type, so you probably want to like, build some more consistent pa uh, patterns around all of that. And then the other important thing is schema, uh, schema evolution. So you probably have a producer producing schema data structure four fields, but tomorrow it's five fields or maybe three. Uh, how do you evolve this without breaking your uh, consumers that's trying to re uh, react to all those like, events happening in real time? So all these challenges, but then in case you probably are wondering, uh, you know, I'm not Uber, I don't have this, this, this much amount of data to deal with, uh, why should I really care? I mean, that, that was the premise of the conference, right? You probably might have heard several breakout sessions, so many different keynotes, uh, companies talking about digital transformation, cloud native architectures, and all these benefits. I'm not going to get into all of that, but I just want to like, say that. I mean, think about you know, this from the perspective of whether you have this large volumes of data to deal with or complexity around your different systems to deal with. But at least think about like, uh, you know, wanting to go back one, uh, from the conference and learn and adapt to some of these patterns that you've heard. Maybe like, try and fail. Uh, it's better to fail fast than like, letting it continue, right? So I just want to throw that out there. OK, so now we have seen problems and the challenges. And what do we do from Spring's perspective? Uh, so I want to start with Spring Cloud Stream. Uh, how many of you have heard about Spring Cloud Stream or using Spring Cloud Stream? All right, it's great. It's about 20, 25%. Um, I want to uh, maybe quickly take this opportunity to like, briefly introduce what this framework does. Uh, for folks who are unfamiliar with, not familiar with this framework, um, so Spring Cloud Stream is an abstraction for message channel. A, a channel uh, is, a, is, a, is a primitive in, in the framework through which the business logic that you write uh, connects, uh, that, that connects to the message broker, external message broker like Kafka and, and uh, RabbitMQ and such. So that, that 
the channel abstraction and also the, the, the method through which we bind this business logic to the external broker, we call it a binder. And that comes up with an abstraction that is an implementation for a variety of message brokers. Uh, so RabbitMQ, Kafka, Google PubSub, Kinesis, Azure Event Hubs, even the uh, Solus people have their, their own uh, binder implementation. So some are externally contributed. Uh, the, the, the main thing I want to convey here is, uh, is that the opportunities that I have at the bottom of the slide, uh, this is your business logic that you're writing, uh, a business logic saying, hey, I'm going to produce this data, and I don't care where I'm going to put it, but this, this business logic, whatever it's doing to produce this information, uh, it's a drop and replacement uh, to, a, to, to produce this information to a variety of different brokers. So you don't have to worry about plumbing and the infrastructure in terms of how this business logic is going to connect to Kafka or Azure Event Hubs. Uh, we, we take care of that. We engineer that behind the scenes. We take care of that for you. So you just focus on your business logic. You write your test cases and make sure that, test, uh, that the business logic is going uh, to be robust enough to run it in production. And also Spring Cloud Stream comes up with some, a few other feature value adds, uh, especially stream partitions, especially if you have a stateful streaming workload. Uh, go back to the Uber use case. Uh, you have some driver and the passenger uh, who are connected. Uh, and that connected thing is a unique transaction. And imagine that transaction being uh, always partitioned by that unique ID of some kind, and always all that context-specific data is routed to one app instance, and that app instance then becomes a really rich information for someone to do some analytics on. They can do something like, okay, how do I estimate fair uh, ETA, or maybe estimate the price for this route, or maybe uh, um, you know, split uh, fares with friends who are in the same common ride, or something like that. So all the different value adds you can build once you have all that collocated information, so you can do some meaningful, interesting uh, uh, downstream analytics. And the consumer groups, especially if you have like uh, parallel data processing, you have n number of app instances performing a similar com compute operation. And if you're adding or removing based on throughput requirements, uh, we have this concept of consumer group, uh, which, which sort of natively is provided by some of the brokers. We just like build upon it, make it more easier for Java developers and Spring developers to consume it. Uh, so as and when you add new consumers, they all compete for messages. Because they are competing for messages, uh, they become a load balance state, so you, you can parallelize uh, your data compute operation. And the message your headers is another important feature, especially for scheme evolution. Uh, as I mentioned about like producer producing a schema with V1, tomorrow it's V2. Uh, and the V2 meaning the payload data structure change. So how, do you, how, the, how does the consumer know how to react to this V2 schema? Uh, how does it make sure that it's backward and forward compatible? Uh, so you can build some semantics uh, uh, using this feature with uh, Spring Cloud Stream. And the other things that, that I want to quickly go over is you as a developer, if you want to use Spring Cloud Stream, there are like two different ways that you can write your business logic. The imperative style, if you're familiar with it, or if you want to like do, get into more functional style, you probably can. Uh, you, you, you choose that as an option to write your business logic with it. Again, we help you out with uh, you know, building and testing that um, uh, from, from a framework standpoint. Content type negotiation is another interesting thing, especially if the producer is producing some byte array and the consumer needs to con con convert that to a JSON or of some other codec type. Uh, you know, we provide some converters out of the box from the framework perspective, so it's just a matter of like, you overriding your boot property, saying a consumer is going to be of this, uh, consuming this content type on this, this, this data type, and the framework will, will automatically convert it for you. If, if that, the list of con converters that we support is not, uh, doesn't fit the bill for you, you can bring in your own converter and register that and use that. Uh, so it will be much, much seamless extension for you to like, use the framework on top of it. And the last one is the testing stuff that I mentioned early on. So now that's real quick brief on Spring Cloud Stream itself. Uh, but I want to like quickly show a demonstration of how this, someone can build this type of application, uh, given that there are 50% of, uh, of us here haven't seen a Spring Cloud Stream app before. Uh, I want to take some time to like quickly go over two different applications. So I have, uh, I have um, actually, let me actually uh, put a, paint a picture on what I'm going to do. So imagine uh, Uber having something like user management system. Uh, where users are being constantly created. Uh, there's like drivers being added. Drivers need to be validated. Background check needs to happen. Once that is completed, they probably are established and they are available for, uh, for using the system. And likewise, passengers are getting added. Passengers are updating their profile information, credit card information, things like that. All these are events, right? And they are happening in real time. Uh, and, and, and these events uh, are, are, are interesting for Uber because 
you know, based on some of those real-time insights, they probably can build business, uh, business solutions and products uh, and, and make some real-time decisions, right? Someone can, uh, you know, connect this user management system with other microservices in Uber's architecture and do something like drivers nearby and do something real-time analytics to figure out search pricing, when it needs to be turned on, when it needs to be turned off, and then the split fares and other interesting use cases. So all these types of use cases can be um, done, not just with user management system, just like oversimplifying it, but other microservices that are doing similar things. Uh, you can you know, mix and match and then build these types of ad hoc analytics like to figure things out. So I'm going to quickly go over this code to show what this uh, uh, user management system or, uh, might look like, look like. So I have this simple Spring Cloud Stream app. Um, I'm opening up the palm, so this, hopefully this is uh, big enough for the folks in the back. So I have this one dependency. This dependency says that the Spring Cloud Stream binder Kafka. So this is what indicates uh, to the boot application that I need to auto-configure all the Kafka goodness, right? So when, when the application starts, so whatever the host port that you provide to the application YAML, so it's going to like automatically make the connection, be ready for, uh, for use. I'm going to go to the, the actual application itself. And in this case, this application is having like few, few extra annotations here. The first interesting one is the enable binding source. So this, this is what indicates to Spring Cloud Stream saying, uh, when this application starts, and, and, and the fact that it's, it's, it's saying I'm a source app, it's going to claim that I'm a producer, I'm going to produce some data. And I'm going to produce that data onto this channel name output, and this is the only channel that's, that I'm configured with, and I'm going to bind that channel uh, to a destination named users. So what that really means is, I can't maximize it, oh, here we go. What that really means is, uh, for the output channel that's going to produce data, it's going to like dump the data onto this topic named users in Kafka, for example. So it's as simple as that. So from developer perspective, you just add that annotation, and then you configure where you want to dump the data onto, and, and, and that's pretty much it. Now you have full flexibility in your code to like write however the business logic you want to write. In, in my case, I have this uh, simple function that's actually scheduled to run uh, every 100 millisecond to create new user objects. And, 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 and at the end of this, every, every 100 millisecond, I'm going to like publish new events onto that uh, topic named user. But speaking of user object, in this case, this is the aggregate. Um, uh, by the way, this is, I'm not going to get into the whole domain-driven design, the event sourcing, you know, CQRs, all that good stuff. This is a really good talk from uh, Kenny Bastani, Yakub. You know, they're all subject matter experts in this, and, and they, they've done a lot of recording on it. So I encourage you to go watch uh, how people, you know, they, they start from scratch, build all these aggregate from the beginning, and define the behaviors, write the test, validate the behavior. It's amazing. I highly recommend that. Um, so yeah, so this, this, this is a simple aggregate object. Uh, going back to the aggregate object, I, I quickly want to explain uh, how would someone go about building that type of uh, uh, domain event. So in my application, user is the aggregate. That's the domain that I'm, I'm dealing with. And someone would go about doing an event star storming -like session where it's like n number of teams coming together, defining all the domains and the events that are happening within their system. They define a boundary, they, they, they build a context around, and then, then they say, uh, this is the exchange uh, type that I want to like produce as part of my application, and they define the contract, and that becomes as part of the API, so the other downstream uh, consumers and applications can react to and consume information from. So once you have a user object aggregate defined, and you probably can imagine some mutable operations. Mutable operations are the ones that actually change the state of the aggregate. Uh, things like user created, user activated, deactivated. And likewise, there are some, some operations that are read-only, right? I mean, imagine you wanting to pull information about this user. Uh, they, they don't mutate the aggregate, but they're just like querying for the, the, the latest uh, state, and then they're going to provide that to someone who's interested in it. So that, that just like gets into the separation of concerns from commands and queries perspective. And uh, now you can build like highly uh, uh, cohesive and loosely coupled sort of applications and API uh, design around all of this. And the last one is event sourcing. We talked about it. We saw that in the keynote as well. The idea being if you had a state and that state is already uh, computed with the latest information. If, for example, if for, for instance, that application crashes, for, for instance, and all the state about this user object is like now persistent in an append-only log, you have a way to go back in history and then rebuild that state. So that way you can uh, you know, get to the current state on what, what this object is all about. So that's, that's a real quick brief on how someone would go about building these types of aggregates. But here, I'm going to quickly highlight the states. Uh, I have those created, activated, deactivated, and name change states. 
Uh, and likewise, if I go back to my application, so I'm basically saying create new user ID, and I'm simulating as if uh, some weight I'm doing and, and you know, sleeping, and then saying I'm going to activate after a certain time, and I'm going to like change my name to a certain time. Ultimately, I'm persisting that. But for persistence, uh, I can can maximize it for some reason here. Uh, let me try this a different way. So yeah, so for saving, I'm, I'm just like literally submitting all these change events onto Kafka uh, into this topic that, I, that we just saw, the user's topic. So literally every single uh, record about this user aggregate is just publishing onto this topic. So that's the user producer. So now you know, we are just like creating or simulating as if the users are being generated, right? But what, what would Uber do with this type of information? So how would they go about like using this information? For example, I uh, just saw this. It gets down to like someone like in the product management team at Uber wanting to like figure out what's the trending region where all the new users are being created. Why would they care about it? Like maybe it's it's interesting for this product manager because they can go about like publishing new promotions to this set of users, or maybe uh, they can try out a new beta feature and see how these users are engaging with this thing. Maybe that hypothesis can be validated. They can like make some real time decisions whether this is going to be successful. So those are all these kinds of interesting things that they, they, they can do once these, these types of events can, events can happen real time. So that's exactly what the consumer is going to do. So the consumer is another Spring Cloud Stream app. Uh, it's, 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 it's using Kafka Streams Binder, which is what uh, Sobe will cover in length, what this, what this, uh, what this brings to the table. Uh, but other than that, this application says, I am, I'm going uh, to have a custom interface for channels, and I, I'm going to have a KStream input and KStream out. I'm going to receive data onto this channel by, uh, by the name users by region input. Uh, but the mapping for that is really uh, you know, the same topic. So the user's region input is going to consume from the same topic what my, what my user producer app application is publishing events to. So it's basically consuming all the user data that I'm publishing from my producer, in other words. But the interesting bit here is um, the stream listener annotation Spring Cloud Stream provides. Because it's a processor, it's going to consume that, some data, and then you're going to do some real-time compute. And the computed outcome needs to go out onto a different topic. So stream really uh, simplifies that by having the stream listener annotation. It says, like, I'm going to consume data from this channel. And the computed outcome is going to go to this, uh, another channel called user by region output. And that's backed by a different topic by the name user counts or users count. Um, but this handler, the message handler really is all the events that are coming from my producer that are consumed as KStream events directly. And, and, and in my, uh, in my compute, um, all I'm really doing is I'm literally grouping by the users by region uh, on, a, on a window of 30 seconds. So every 30 seconds, I'm interested in finding out uh, what's the number of users in each region that the producer is producing. And that information, every 30 second bucket of information, I'm also persisting onto the state store provided by Kafka Streams. And there's this concept of materialized view. And that materialized view has a snapshot of every 30 second bucket. So why that is interesting? Because downstream from this, any given point in time, I can query directly on this materialized view and pull out information, do some meaningful visualization dashboard, which is what uh, we're going to build upon on the second demo. So finally, once these 30-second windows and all these aggregates are happening, we're going like, to publish the outcome onto a different topic, which, which goes back as a case stream object. Uh, but it's finally landing onto a, a new topic called user's count. So these are two applications. So the way how I run it, I'm going to run the first set of things in, locally. So I have uh, the user producer. I'm going to start in 9001. I have Kafka running locally as well. So here I have three uh, 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 vertical pa panels in the terminal window. The first one, I'm going to start the producer. And the second one is a consumer. I'm starting at 9000, uh, 9002. And finally, I'm going to use a WebSocket sync that we have as an out-of-the-box sync uh, for, for, as a utility. Uh, here it's saying uh, the processor is going to compute output, and then it's going to put it onto this topic called users count, right? We just saw. And this WebSocket sync is going to consume that event from, uh, from that topic. And then I'm sending in some, some information about content type. Uh, the idea being uh, the data that's coming out of this processor being exposed on a WebSocket port so I can have a UI that read from it. So I'm going to copy the last one, and that application I'm starting. So now the first one is this producer, as you can see, it's, it's, it's actually simulating as the new user records are being generated on some random cadence, because uh, I'm sleeping in some random ca time cadence there. And this information is now transmitting from this, this source app to a topic named user, uh, the output topic named user. 
and then it goes to this processor, which is consuming from a topic named users, and it's doing the compute operation. Unfortunately, I didn't log anything here, so that's why you don't see any chatter. And the computed outcome is now going to use this count topic, and which is the last one, which is the WebSocket consuming it, and it's exposing in the port 9292 in my case. So literally think of these three things as left to right, the data is moving from left to right. Uh, three applications, one is producing, one is processing, and the third one is like serving the data, right? Uh, now, if I go back to my code, I do have another quick uh, UI, a single page application, which is a simple JavaScript, it's just to visualize the data from my WebSocket port. And I'm, I'm creating a WebSocket connection, I'm not gonna walk you through this. But the idea being, uh, someone, uh, the, uh, going back to the use case that we just discussed, someone can quickly uh, you know, tap into this data that's happening in real time, I think it's 9002. So I have this map representation of all these users that are being generated in real time. Uh, so these are the counts that we, that we discussed. So we, we are actually consuming data in real time, and we are computing all this, uh, in, in, in the aggregates in real time. And now the, this is available in, in a state store, and the WebSocket is just serving all this information. The UI is just simply reading from it, and it's highlighting how, uh, how these, these, this the representation can be made. But as you can also notice, like the, once the 30-second window elapses, uh, the, 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 the counter will reset to zero, or it will start from zero, because that, that, the 30 second is a past now, but the information is already available. We can always query from it from, uh, from onwards on, on, on different downstream ways. All right, so that's the end of the first demo. Uh, but I quickly brushed through what, uh, what, what we saw in Kafka Streams, but I haven't really touched on Kafka Streams itself, so I'm going to hand over to Sobi, so he's going to walk us through with all the nitty-gritty details. Go sure, for it. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, as Sabi mentioned in the previous slide, you know, Spring Cloud Stream provides, um, you know, the basic programming model for writing, you know, streaming applications for writing even driven microservices, right? But one of the major core abstractions, as this uh, slide uh, showed, is the binders. So binder abstraction is basically a contract that, that basically hides the detail of, you know, how you actually connect to the, uh, the actual broker, actual middleware. I mean, you can connect to, you know, Kafka, RabbitMQ, or, you know, Amazon Kinesis or anything like that, but the framework is actually you know, taking care of all the details of how that connection is being made. You as the developer, I mean, can simply write code and then don't worry about the details of how all those you know, lower level plumbing is happening. That's taken care of by the, by the framework. So the idea is that you can take the same application that you're running today, that you're running against Kafka today, and then you can take the same program tomorrow and then run it against a different broker. Um, of course, you have to provide like you know configuration, deployment details, but from a code perspective, nothing is changing. That's a you know big uh, point about uh, Spring Cloud Stream. Um, so uh, Spring Cloud Stream's programming model allows uh, you to write various styles of programming. You know you can write like you know request response paradigm. You can if you have like a data ingestion and then then do some processing, uh, filtering and that kind of stuff. You know that that model is supported. One of the other major uh, style of programming that you can, applications that you can write with Spring Cloud Stream is uh, stream processing applications. It's a huge area that, that's actually developing out there. Uh, so when it comes to stream processing, you have a couple of options. One is that you can rely on you know, plain old standard vanilla Java style of you know, stream processing application. Using the standard Java APIs, you can write your own stream processing application, but that involves a lot of you know, different things surrounding that, right? Or you can use uh, Spring Cloud Streams provided built-in, you know, project reactor capabilities like the reactive adapters, you know, and then you can use the reactor libraries for writing, you know, pro stream processing applications. But um, uh, one of the other options that you can do is if you are using Kafka as your, as your middleware, uh, one of the cool things that you can do is that you can use the Apache Kafka Streams library. This is actually a library that comes with Apache Kafka distribution. Uh, it's, a, it's another library. So the, 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 the biggest advantage is that, um, I don't know, if you're, if you're running your processing applications in Spark or Flink or anything like that, your enterprise need to have a dedicated processing cluster for managing a lot of things. And then that involves a lot of different things, right? But um, the difference with the Kafka streams is that uh, if you already have an, in, uh, have, have an investment in Kafka, then running a Kafka streams application comes down to running another 
Kafka consumer. So you basically run your application inside your JVM node inside a processing cluster, and, the, and your Java application will basically work the same way as you run a you know, Kafka consumer. Um, that is a big advantage of uh, writing you know, Kafka streams-based uh, uh, stream processing applications. And then uh, the library supports a lot of first-class uh, stream processing uh, specific operations and, 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 and styles of programming and things like that. The library supports like a first-class functional uh, DSL kind of uh, model, and then it also supports like a lower level uh, processing API if you want to dig deep, you know, that is also possible. Um, and then, um, you know, um, so that, those are some of the uh, bigger advantages of, um, you know, writing uh, code using um, Apache Kafka streams. And then, you know, it's worth to mention that when you get all the benefits of uh, all the guarantees that Kafka provides, right? You know, Kafka provides like great, you know, fault tolerance, you know, replayability, ordering guarantee of your data. Um, you know, all those things kind of come uh, for free when you're doing that. Now, uh, the Spring Cloud Stream, Kafka Streams Binder, it's basically another binder implementation, but there's a big difference. Uh, the thing with all the other binders that we just mentioned, like the regular Kafka binder, RabbitMQ binder, Kinesis binder, they all are built on Spring integration. So you use the message channels as the core foundation to actually connect to the, the binder destination. So the framework will use Spring integration message channels to actually connect your you know, destination on the broker. Uh, but in the case of Kafka Streams, it is rather using the types exposed by Kafka Stream. So instead of binding using a message channel, you use the types exposed by, by Kafka Streams. So, but that is a major, major difference from other binders. But apart from that, from a programming model standpoint, everything else is the same. You can simply use the same exact uh, programming model that you use with other binders, like enable binding, stream listener, all those things. I don't know how many people attended Gary and Victor's talk the other day. They talked about Spring Kafka and the support uh, that it builds for uh, Kafka Streams. So the uh, Kafka Streams binder in Spring Cloud Stream is built on top of that support. So we use Spring Kafka as the, as the foundation. It provides like the factory beans uh, for building your stream builder and stuff like that. So that is another big advantage of using Spring Cloud Stream support of Kafka Streams uh, binder. The thing is that you know, in addition to using the programming model of Spring Cloud Stream, it also relieve the end user from you know, maintaining the life cycle, you know, setting up the infrastructure for Kafka Streams. Otherwise, what, what happens is that if you, if you write a Kafka Streams application from the ground up on your own, you have to worry about you know, uh, you know, setting up your stream, starting that stream, maintaining its life cycle, then defining your topology, then once you're done, you have to stop it, all those things. The binder basically hides all those complexity. So that's a traditional Spring philosophy, right? I mean, you as the end user application developer simply focus on the business logic side of things and then write code uh, that your business needs and let all the other details, such as all these things I mentioned, uh, be taken care of by the Spring Cloud Stream framework itself. So I think that's a big win. And then you have um, the framework provided content type negotiations like your data message, serialization, deserialization, you know, error handling, DLQ, and all those things come for free. So, uh, so let's imagine you have a Kafka topic called foo, right? So, and then you have to, um, you know, and let's also imagine that, that foo has like uh, two different partitions, two partitions. And then you have uh, two application instances, two consumer instances are running here. Now, uh, Kafka Streams supports like three major types. So you have, um, you have a you know, stream of events coming. So as you generate data, that data is coming in as, as a stream. And in Kafka Streams land, it's called a case stream. So you can see that uh, both, your application, uh, both your application instances will receive data, but per partition. So first instance is getting from partition zero. The second application is getting data from partition one. So that is case stream. Now imagine you don't, you don't want that. You, want, you only care about the latest uh, value out there like sort of a database table, uh, the, the latest update. So then they also expose a type called K table, um, in which case you only get the, get the latest value. Now, let's imagine the scenario. You have like five different instances of your, of your application running, but you have to do a lookup against your global set of data, not only 
the, the data for that particular partition. Uh, the Tafka Streams library also exposed another type called global K table. Um, so in that case, you get all the data. There might be you know, performance implications to that, but if your use case requires something like that, it is supported. Now, these are the three types I mentioned before. Instead of the message channels, in the case of Kafka Streams binder, uh, the binder actually use these types to directly bind to your destination. So when you say it binds to KStream, it's actually bound to a topic on the broker, but your code is actually using KStream uh, as the type. Some other quick notes about um, you know, stream processing in general. You know, this uh, Kafka Streams library provides like the stream table duality. For example, let's say you have your data coming in as a stream, then you need to convert that data as a table um, the, that is what the, these two types represent. You can, you can get it as k-stream and then convert that to k-table, or you can get it as a k-table and then convert that to a k-stream. Imagine, you know, in most of the enterprises you have, you know, you, you have your data is running inside a, it's, it's sitting in a database, right? And then many of the databases these days provide a CDC capability, like you can get the data capture, the, 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 the write-ahead logs, and then you can get that data as it comes in your database to a Kafka topic, and then get that streamed into your, into your application. All those things are supported with the library, uh, but in your Spring Cloud Stream application, it all becomes like, you know, transparent. So, so now uh, we're gonna uh, show another demo um, of this um, same use case that Sabi built upon. Imagine that you now uh, saw how your system is running in every 30 seconds. Now, as a, as a business owner, I want to find out, you know, how did I do in the last two minutes or last five minutes? Like we are going to sh uh, show you, like, how did it do, like, in the last two minutes? I want to find out, you know, how each of my states that I'm tracking, you know, did in the last, um, uh, last uh, two minutes. Um, so that is, the, that is the basic premise of this. So, for, for writing a stateless application, I mean, that, that is pretty trivial. Uh, when I say stateless, if you receive data and you have to do some map and uh, filter operation, you, you don't need to you know, keep any state, track, uh, tra track the state. But when you have to do anything beyond that, for example, let's say you have to do some aggregation, you have to do some windowing operation, you have to do some count, moving average, those kind of things, that requires you know, keeping state. You need, to, you need to track the state. Uh, how do you do that? So uh, Sabi briefly touched on that. Uh, Apache Kafka Streams is rocks DB as its uh, state store, so anything that it, that it needs to track, it basically persist into, the, into, in, into, the, in, into a rocks DB database. So for example, on line 53 here, uh, when you actually take a count uh, for every 30 seconds, what's happening is that that data is persisted um, onto a rocks DB database. Uh, Kafka also, for, for uh, you know, fault tolerance reasons, it also you know, uh, store that into a, into a Kafka topic behind the scenes if you need to recover for any particular reasons. But by default, it's, it's, uh, it's being stored in a rocks DB instance. Now, uh, you can actually go back and query that uh, state store. Uh, that is actually a you know, very nice feature. I mean, the thing is that while your application is running, as it you know, collects data, uh, in this case, into particular windows, you can actually go back. In addition to you know, querying the current window, you can go back and say, hey, I want to find out the last 30 windows. How did I do in the last 30 window, windows, last 100 windows? Uh, those things are possible um, with, by querying the state store. They call it as interactive query. So the Spring Cloud Stream uh, binder provides some nice abstractions on top of this basic interactive query. We call it as interactive query service, using which you can actually query the store. You can get the store. And then you can, then later on, you can actually uh, do queries for finding out my windows, my counts from the previous, uh, previously you know, persisted information. Now, uh, the cool thing with, this, you know, with uh, Spring is that you can actually combine you know, things like Spring MVC or Spring Web, you know, things like that. And then you can uh, produce like very powerful you know, web applications. You can, you can put them put these uh, interactive queries through a pressed endpoint, and then that's exactly what we're doing here. Um, we are using the interactive query service to you know, query the, the, the state store uh, for finding out you know, 
how did my business do in the last two minutes? I, I saw how, how, how I'm doing in the, in, in the current 30 seconds, but I want to find out you know, how did I do in the last uh, two minutes. Uh, so there's nothing you know, major stuff going on here. We're just you know, making a call into the interactive query service API, get the store, and then uh, do a query for the last uh, two minutes windows. Now Sabi's going to run that, and then um, uh, we're going to uh, see the UI. So this is like a UI. Um, you can see that it's like a 30 seconds window from the last two minutes. So you see like four columns there. So in the right-hand column, you see that it's uh, keep updating uh, as you get like new drivers or passengers and stuff like that. Uh, that, um, that column on the right-hand side is constantly updated. And it, this is like a rolling window. So once your you know, two minutes is passed, uh, the, the first 30 seconds is going to drop off, fall off from the, from the UI, and it's, uh, it's going to... Uh, it's going to get updated like that. So that it, that's because we are particularly querying for uh, two minutes, but in the code, you can actually configure to query for more windows or, or a lesser number of windows. Now, can you go back to the code? Code. Yeah, we also provide another uh, rest endpoint there. Uh, let's say I don't want to find out you know, my two minutes window, but I also want to find out how did I do in the last one hour? What was the cumulative you know, count of my users, count of my drivers or passengers or whatever from the last one hour? So we can use another query to you know, get that information and we expose another REST endpoint for that. So that's another UI uh, out there uh, that is sort of, uh, you know, these widgets basically so, uh, see, uh, show like, you know, um, the, the, the rates for each state uh, over the course of last, uh, last um, one hour. So that is the, uh, that is the demo, but before I, uh, before I finish, can you go back to the code one more time, Sabi? Can you scroll up, yeah. Uh, so in this, um, in this uh, uh, stream listener here, I wanna make a quick few points here. So although we only bind only one case stream here, you can actually bind multiple, multiple types there. For example, you can, you can actually, as a handler argument, you can, uh, we only really have one case stream. You can have multiple case streams. You can have K table. So if you have a K table, that means that, you know, it's coming from a different topic. Or you can put like a global K table there. So the framework will actually bind all those things for you. Um, in this case, you see that it is a domain event as a, as like a, you know, a POJO. But how is that getting converted? By default, the framework uh, will use like JSON to you know, convert that data. Uh, but you can also um, actually disable that and let uh, Kafka streams do, do the 30 stuff and do the deserialization at the broker level. That is also possible. On the return side, you see that the method actually returns a case stream. Uh, but um, you can also send the data to multiple Outputs. That's a common use case in, in the Kafka stream, stream processing world. Let's say based on some sort of filtering, you want to you want to send my this piece of data to topic one, this piece of data to you know topic two. You can send a case stream array uh, as the return type, and then the framework will detect that. Oh, you're sending it to multiple topics, so you know that is also 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 possible. I mean, all these things, if you do it by you know do it from ground up, you need to write a lot of code. But in this case, the framework abstracts uh, um, all those things for you. And then if you want, you can, you know, um, when you get like deserialization errors, you can send the, send the records in error to a DLQ, and, um, um, you know, those things are possible. So that's a quick overview of, you know, what is possible with um, Kafka Streams binder in Spring Cloud Stream. So let me give it back to Sabi. All right, cool. Uh, so, yeah, just to reiterate what we just saw, right? So. Uh, we have these three types of widgets in this one single page application. So you see up on the left, left corner of the map, uh, that's actually updating in real time uh, based on web sockets. The other two widgets are like querying against the same uh, bucketed information that's available in the state store. Uh, and we are able to like make some interactive queries in the dashboard uh, rapidly. So this is the type of use cases that you know, Uber could potentially come up with to build these types of applications more rapidly given the, all this real time events happening. Uh, just to continue on from here, so I want to quickly uh, jump right uh, into, uh, yeah, I'll, uh, just to level set again. So we talked about all those challenges Uber might have and, 
and all these different types of eventing that might be that might be happening in real time, and and them having to build these types of systems with uh, considering reliability, scalability, maintainability, and portability into account. So I'm going to double click on that. So the first one, reliability. Uh, obviously, we saw Spring Cloud Stream how it can help you as a developer to build, uh, build, test, and productionize your business logic. Uh, so that's why there's a, a there's a boot logo next to it. So that's something that we can take care of and we help you out with it. But then once you have an application, you need to run that reliably. So that's when uh, we delegate that to a platform uh, to, to run that resiliently. So like Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry can help you out with it. So it's always a combination, right? So I mean, you have a, we, we provide a framework, we set up a we set of best practices around it, and, and, and you need a platform to run this type of business logic. And from scalability standpoint, again, the Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry like platforms will provide you auto scale, so you can expand and shrink as, as, you, as the real time demand uh, requires it. And, and from frame, framework's perspective, I have a boot logo on the second bullet there for linear throughput characteristics. That's because when you scale your consumers, uh, how, do you, how do you make sure these, these applications are now like, able to like, automatically load balance and be able to like, uh, you know, participate in that data processing uh, uh, layer? So uh, we provide some simpler overridable uh, uh, boot properties so you can take advantage of all of that to uh, change that behavior as, as and when and how it works for you. And from the maintainability standpoint, so that's where we really uh, shine. So Spring obviously is, 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 you know, takes the philosophy of making, uh, keeping simple things simple and complex things possible. Uh, so we provide the idioms and in, in, in the well-established you know, practices in terms of developing these applications that are more production grade. But then we extend that and provide, think about like, all these data-centric workloads that you probably have. Uh, why must those data-centric workloads uh, not uh, be a part of this modern software in engineering practices? Why can't it go through CI/CD cycle? Wh how, uh, why would it be just reserved only for REST applications? Why can't it be for data processing applications? Which is where we have spent a lot of time in, 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 in the project that I'm going to describe uh, in the next slide. Uh, so we provide native abilities for you to do CD, uh, continuous delivery and deployment for data-centric workloads as well. So that's another uh, big value, uh, value add. When comparing with other streaming products that you see in the market or you probably are using, so we are uniquely differentiable on that perspective. And the portability, again, it's, it's a spring boot story, right? So if you run in the laptop, laptop, it should run exactly the same in any platform that you run it in a containerized workload. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to switch gear and go and describe what we do from Spring Cloud Dataflow perspective. Uh, so we call it a toolkit for streaming and batch and data integration workloads. Uh, but the value proposition, uh, proposition really is, uh, you know, we saw Spring Cloud Stream, so you can use that framework to build streaming workloads, and you can use Spring Cloud Task, on the other hand, to build batch data pipelines. So we provide all these frameworks and the, the test infrastructure and the best practices around how you can build these types of applications, uh, but, but, but ultimately you're building Spring Boot apps, right? So the apps that you are, or the programming model that you're familiar with for REST workload, you're extending that and then like reimagining your data-centric workloads to be part of the same, uh, same you know, paradigm. So you, your, your toolkits, your, your CI, CD automation, all of that gets consistent and you know, consolidated in a way. So you can, you're extending the best practices for data-centric workloads. Uh, that's really uh, uh, you know, exciting, and, and, and the customers who use it, we, we get a lot of feed, feedback around all of this uh, consistency and consolidation that they uh, you know, get while using our projects. And the second one, of, of course, is the, all this data integration uh, adapters that we have. So we have built our own set of apps building on top of these frameworks. They are available as utility apps. And Dataflow provides these tools, uh, like client tools, like you have REST APIs, DSL, drag and drop, UI. So you can imagine having all these apps that you build, drag and drop, and build this pipeline, which is exactly what I'm going to show next. And the continuous delivery, which I briefly touched on in the previous slide, so this, 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 the project Spring Cloud Skipper in the Spring ecosystem helps you, uh, you know, orchestrate and, 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 and you know, version your streams, the version, the pipeline, and imagine that pipeline as a set of components that can be like independently upgraded, rolling upgraded, or roll back to the previous version. I'll briefly show the commands in a minute. And for bad jobs, we have a, a cron job scheduler implementation as well. So now the last one, I guess to close it, close it out, I uh, want to like, uh, you know, show the same set of apps that, I, that we were demonstrating in the local machine. How do we deploy this onto the cloud platform? So what would be the experience like for you as a developer? So which is exactly the same uh, visual that we just saw. So this pipeline is producer producing data going to the processor that's doing all this real-time compute. And finally, uh, there's some data going to WebSocket and, and, and the remaining 
uh, are being asynchronously pulled from, uh, from the state storage, and those two widgets are going to update uh, in real time. So how do we uh, run this, right? So I'm going to like pull up, this is where I'm going to pull up data flow. So I have, uh, uh, I have a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so I have a cluster running in GKE. Uh, the data flow server is already uh, being um, provisioned and installed along with Kafka and a few other things. Uh, Dataflow is nothing but a Spring Boot application, so it's, it just is a REST service. I'm, I'm going to hit the dashboard directly to, uh, to access it so I can build a pipeline with it. Um, while well, this is loading, hopefully the Wi-Fi keeps up. All right, that's good. So I have these three apps that we just saw, right? The same exact applications that I ran Java-char in my local uh, machine. Uh, the only difference being here, these applications are Dockerized. These are Docker images. There are two custom apps that are in my account in Docker Hub. And the WebSocket Sync, as I mentioned, this is an application that we provide. It's, it's available in the Spring Cloud Stream Docker Hub org. I have these three apps. You can you imagine you building these custom apps. You come and register it here, and so they show up in the palette here. So once you have these applications, you pull up this uh, drag and drop canvas, and we get more real estate here. So I'm going to build a pipeline with it. The first one is the user producer, right? And then the user by region is the processor, and the last one is WebSocket Sync. So this is the exact same thing that I ran locally. And now the data flow provides this experience where which you quickly can build this type of pipeline once you have these apps established. It's just a matter of telling data flow, hey, I'm going to run, I want to run this as a cohesive unit. I want to uh, make sure that they, uh, uh, I, want to, I want you to handle all the connectivity information, how this application come together, how they'll be deployed in Kubernetes and all that. And me as a developer, I don't really care how this is going to run, right? So that's, that's the expectation that developers will have. So I'm going to create a stream named Foo. So one, I, I just created it, but I haven't deployed it yet, right? So the deployment step is a separate step. Uh, it's for intentionally done, um, because now we, uh, developers can get more access into all these application-specific properties, how I want to change the behavior of this app. Or maybe I want to add some extra compute power. I want to like, increase the memory for my processor, things like that. Or maybe I want to install or, or deploy two or three instances of, the, of this app before I, uh, I, I start, start my deployment. Uh, so like that, I have, um, uh, there's another ability for which I can uh, I can plug a few other properties, and I'm going to like specifically override a few uh, properties for each of these apps. So let me copy it, and I'll explain what, what's happening. So the first one is about the user producer. This is a producer producing data onto the output channel. We saw the same thing to a topic named user. And the processor is going to process a user by region. It's going to pick up from, whoa. It's going to pick up from the same topic named user. And then it's going to uh, produce the computed outcome onto, the, uh, onto a topic named user's count, which is exactly the same thing we saw before as well. And the WebSocket sync is like going to consume from the same topic. So that way, there's, this data is coming from here, it's going here, and finally, it's landing here. And then I'm sending in a few other extra properties for my WebSocket sync. And then I'm also like indicating a data flow to use boot version uh, 2 for my two custom apps, because we are using uh, 2.1 Spring Cloud Streams. Uh, so some of the latest Kafka Streams features are available in it. So Dataflow provides an option for you to like, select between boot versions. So that's another important thing that we worked on. Uh, so you have backward compatible uh, at, the, at the app orchestration layer. And then we are exposing WebSocket on a, on a port. So when I deploy this stream, so what's happening behind the scene is like Dataflow now interpreting that DSL, saying I have a source processor and a sync. I know where these apps are hosted. They are in this Docker account. I'm going to resolve them. I'm going to download and then like deploy them onto this cloud platform. So what's, what's really happening now, you, you can see there's a deployment for all three apps that are initiated by Dataflow. And there's a backing service for all those three things. And now there are three parts coming up for backing those three apps. So this is, uh, this is further simplifying uh, from a developer, developer's perspective. You don't really have to care about how it gets deployed. So the Dataflow does it for you. Uh, the, your goal and your responsibility is being you write and make sure that application that you write is production grade by having all kinds of test runners around it, and you just dockerize this image, and that becomes a reusable artifact. You get to share that with other teams in the enterprise, so that way it, it's more uh, you know, uh, widely adopted and more used, and you, know, you can iteratively improve that experience over and over. So these applications are now going through uh, you know, boot start lifecycle. Like it's, it's about... Uh, a minute, all these pods will start, and they all will start to do the same thing what they, they were doing uh, locally. Um, and, and there is also Kafka running alongside as a service. So Dataflow knew how, how, these, um, how these pods uh, need, need to be supplied with the Kafka credentials. So when these pods for all these apps get started, so these Kafka credentials are automatically 
supplied, uh, and when the app starts, the boot order configuration magic kicks in. And because this Kafka binder is a dependency for, for all the two, two, three apps, they automatically make connection, and then they come together as this one cohesive unit. So let's see what's happening. So it's, it seems like they're all running, but they are coming to a ready state. It looks like WebSocket is all, already in ready state, and the user by region is already in ready state. And in the meantime, uh, if you go to the runtime tab, this is another experience in data flow. You can quickly see what's going on with each, each part, some information about each of those parts. And, and also there's audit traceability information that we provide, what happened to a stream named Foo, and who did what, and what kind of host is interacting with it. So that gives you more traceability on what happened to this whole, whole thing, right, as a stream. Instead of you interacting with individual apps, you're interacting with one cohesive unit. Uh, this, this cohesive unit can now be versioned, so you can roll back and update it as, as you wish. So it looks like the stream is running. Uh, so I'm going to launch the uh, load balancer that's, uh, that's accessible for my app, uh, the, the single page app that we saw before, so that's accessible here. So this is exactly the same thing, right? This, this application is doing its thing. It's updating in real time, doing the WebSocket fun. Uh, and likewise, the, all the buckets are in state store, backed by Kafka and RocksDB. And this widget is updating in real time. It's doing its thing, querying on the same state store. And uh, they're coming together happily. And, and now it's, it's platform responsibility for this part to be running in production successfully, right? I can muck around with it. I can say, uh, delete the part. And this is, this is prone to happen in real time, right? So people will go through this all the time. So now that part is terminated, but then there's a new container that got created automatically. So now it becomes a platform's responsibility, and now this application will run reliably and resiliently. So going back to the data intensive categories that we discussed before, uh, the fact that these are running natively in these platforms, now you can take advantage of platform-specific capabilities. I can auto-scale these parts up and down. Uh, I, can, I can guarantee these applications are going to run uh, all the time. So these are some, some, some specifics that uh, you know, Spring and the platform coming together could solve for some of the challenges that we saw with, um, uh, as, uh, as the challenges early on. With that said, uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, real quick on next steps. So you saw all this uh, Kafka stream demo so far. Uh, but this is very, very obvious that some of the stream processing compute thing usually consume from multiple topics, compute from multiple topics, do some correlation, and publish onto like multiple, multiple different topics. Uh, going back to what Sobio was explaining before us, you can uh, consume SK stream array and s s return SK stream arrays, for example. So those are interesting things. So we're thinking about like uh, flex uh, easing it out in the data flow uh, uh, spec, uh, spec like, so that you can, the DSL can accept it, the UI can accept it. Uh, it becomes a more first class citizen for, for orchestrating those types of apps. And we're also imagining all these apps that you're building as boot apps, what if like, they are reusable functions so your processing can be a compute that can be plug and play, right? So uh, a source and the processor can be combined into one, one part, can be combined and ran in one part, for example, for some co-located reason, or maybe it's more easier, simple functions, why, why even run as individual parts and consume the resources? So we are like putting a lot of effort in uh, reimagining our apps and data flow to, uh, to be of this form, and uh, Oleg presented about some of these uh, next steps in yesterday's talk, so that should be available in recording, so I'd, I'd recommend you watch that. And, uh, once, once it's out. And the last one is audit trail. Again, the streaming and the way how things come together in production is interesting, but what if, uh, what if I want to like uh, version something, right? I have something like um, a, a foo name, something like this. I have three versions for it. And if I want to like update this thing, uh, I have a simple command. I can pull up the data flow thing and then quickly uh, update, start updating individual components without impacting my upstream or downstream or whichever position you're updating. Or I can like always roll back uh, to a certain version, which is pretty powerful too. I mean, why these things need to be reserved only for REST workload, which is which is where we we spend enormous time like thinking about like all these tools and you know, you know functionality that might be more useful for developers uh, who want to like uh, you know work on data intensive work applications, and we we, we try and provide native abilities uh, through data flow for that. I believe that is the end of uh, what we wanted to share. Uh, at this point, uh, I guess uh, we can open it up for Q&A. And any questions for us? Yes.
Uh, that's a great question. The question was, how, how does Dataflow know how, uh, w what version of each of the apps in the stream are? How does it keep track of it? How would a developer interact with it? Does it sound close enough? Yes. Okay. Uh, so the, w what, what Dataflow provides is this option of uh, registering n number of versions to the same app, right? So if you if I uh, go to my app list, so this is my app list, which is actually really poorly formatted. Let me try and shrink this so we can see together. So these are all some of the out-of-the-box apps that we provide. Um, it's actually formatted really bad. Oh, and then what we, what we also provide is this option for optionally saying, I have an app named Foo, and the type being source, I can, I can point to some Maven Yuri dot com or something, and then I can, and this would ultimately will have some version attached to it, right, build, uh, something like that. So what we do is when you register this application, we automatically parse through this URI and then like determine what the version is, and then we keep track of it in, uh, in, as a, a list of versions this application is available for, right? So that's one thing. So you're registering n number of app versions to Dataflow. But then there's a default version, by default, you, It'll be the first one that gets registered. You can swap the version while deploying the stream. But when you deploy a, a stream, what, what we keep track of via, via Skipper is this uh, manifest file. And this manifest says uh, information about, includes information about each of the applications. So for example, log sync is at version 1.2.0. And if I have 1.3 version, 1.3.0 version, uh, and I'm going to update the same stream and say version.log equals 13.0 release, uh, then Dataflow and Skipper, Skipper behind the scene will do the diff and then say, oh, I'm going to change the version. And the, the prerequisite is that version needs to be registered in Dataflow. So as far as it's available, it will do the swap out and it will determine that new version needs to be spawned with 1.3.0 release. So there's this source of truth is Skipper. It keeps track of all the versions of each of the app. And the app registry in Dataflow facilitates that by providing, this is a coordinate for this version of the app. That's, that's the connection. Did that answer your question? Yes. OK. Thank you. Sure. Yes, sir. Uh, Abro. Yeah, yeah we do, actually. Yeah, both in regular Spring Cloud stream applications and Kafka streams applications, if you want to deserialize or serialize your data, you can just specify the content type on the actual binding and then it'll automatically be converted using Avro. So Dataflow, uh, the open source, uh, we, we support local, which is your you know, local box, and we, we have Cloud Foundry, and we have Kubernetes. So it doesn't have to be, uh, it can be any Kubernetes version. Like we, we do have a matrix, and if you're familiar with uh, uh, all the Kubernetes master versions. So we have a compatibility matrix that we actively test against. So these are all the versions that, uh, that you can run. So it's, you can run against any Kubernetes version, in other words. The Cloud Foundry version, you can run it on PWS, but we also have a, a Cloud Foundry tile. So if you have a PCF install, you can use that tile to provision it more easily. Yes? Uh, I heard like, one of the earlier talks about Spring Cloud Function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, I, I briefly touched on it, but yeah, I wasn't very clear. So this, I, this idea of composable functions, so these apps that, that I showed in the table here, uh, so these apps are full-blown boot applications, right? So, uh, you know, Oleg is Spring Cloud Stream Lead, so he, he, he learned from the field from real-time experience that some of the customers are trying to, like, combine these apps into one thing. And some of the filtering capability doesn't need to have full-blown boot application, like full-blown compute power, right? So they are simple transformations, simple filtering. So you, you, you want to be in, in situation to plug and play them, combine them, so you, uh, you can reuse those effectively. So he's leading an initiative uh, where he's trying to like imagine bringing or simplifying the experience where which someone wanting to build uh, the business logic, you know, the business logic being a supplier, which is a producer equivalent, a function is consuming and producing something, and then the third one being the consumer. These are Java util function interfaces, right? So we are imagining all these apps in, in, in the similar paradigm so that uh, you know, uh, HTTP source can be a simple supplier, or JDBC source can be a simple supplier. Now you can combine a supplier and a, and a function together into one app, and that way that can be orchestrated as one single wood application into a bare part in Kubernetes, for example. So, 
Uh, that's the thinking. We haven't really gone through converting all the apps yet, but we have, uh, we have Elia, who is leading that initiative from our team, who is uh, going through you know, the, the process of reimagining some of those apps into this function. So. Right. Yeah, so Oleg is saying it's, it's already there for sources and sinks. We are just like in the process of polishing it. So eventually we'll have a blog about detailing how someone would go about building them. So that's the, uh, the next steps really for us, like to get into that realm and, and, and start to like get, uh, start to like make it more easier for our developers. Cool. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I'll touch it briefly. Uh, so Spring Cloud Stream provides a schema registry as a separate component. Uh, you need to build that as a schema registry server, a separate boot application that runs as a as application, right? Uh, Spring Cloud Stream applications can now interact with it. So you, your producer is now, when it starts, it says, like, I'm publishing to my schema registry saying, I'm a producer and I can handle the schema of version v2. Right? And, and then the consumer who is like going to consume this message can make the same uh, remote call to the schema registry server to like determine whether I'm compatible with the schema, whether I'm able to handle it. And that's how you, you define this into end scenario of schema evolution, right? So that's one aspect of it. So you can use our schema registry if you may wish. Uh, but for pe people who are familiar with Kafka and Confluent stack, um, they, they want to use Confluent schema registry, which is very relevant. We see a, lo a lot of chatter around that. So we, we have a native support for Confluent schema registry. So if you wish you want to use that, totally you can. It's completely optional. In that uh, last, last slide uh, um, that uh, Sabi showed, there's actually a samples repository. So there are like samples provided uh, that demonstrates you know, how you do schema registry interaction with both Spring Cloud Stream provided schema registry and Confluent. Uh, schema registry as well. So yeah, that's the that's this folder. So you see both the options there. So the one these are this is our our schema registry and this is the confluent one. So both the demonstration you can learn from it. Cool, it's a good one. Any other questions? Yes. I have a question around uh, Kafka in general. Like you mentioned that uh, RocksDB is behind both Mechanized and Like I'm more interested in knowing like how does it scale because we are doing. It's actually per consumer instance when you say uh, the rocks DB, so it's like per consumer. So it's whatever that whatever your resources are for that consumer instance. But uh, if you have use cases to, you know, go with other kind of technologies, this is the, this is pluggable. You can actually disable rocks DB and then use something else like you know um, some other technologies to do that, but that is, you know, then that has other implications that might be performance implications when you have to go like external, you know, route and things like that. But it, it is possible, you know, if you have, if you're, you know, so worried about I that. Can use instead of Rocks, I can use some other right. Postgres, so yeah, it's completely possible, yeah. I think they have a, they detail that in their kind of document on how to change that state store. And all those things are going to be, you know, transparent when it comes to the Spring, Spring Cloud Stream level. With those things are completely hidden, like what what the technology underlying. Yeah. Cool. So another question there. Yes. I'll just repeat the question. Hopefully, I'll try and repeat it. Uh, I think uh, you were wondering uh, what, what, what is the concept of sources in data flow? Uh, is the sources or something that, that sort of do a polling based uh, production of events? I mean, what happens if, uh, or what if it's the web application that are producing events? How do we consume and like reason through in a stream definition? Uh, yeah, so the idea is. Uh, you know, we, pro we provide sources that are like polar based, right? So it's like on a specific schedule cadence, it's gonna like produce some events, reach out to the external database and produce every five seconds or something like that. 
but then we also provide uh, in Dataflow the concept of a name destination, which, which roughly uh, gets into uh, you know, creating streams from arbitrary topics and channels. So we have this idea of saying, I have a topic named foo, and I want to like filter the data that I'm receiving from foo. Oh, I don't have the, uh, I have one minute remaining, so let me quickly go through it. Maybe we can continue this conversation offline too, but uh, just to show it, uh, so you create a stream with uh, saying, I have a name destination, I have uh, data coming from foo, and then I say I, I, I want to filter it, and I want to like say I write to Cassandra or something like that. So this is definition, this foo is, becomes a topic, so you can, have any type of polycloud application publish events onto this topic, and we consume it natively and quickly build this pipeline with it. So that's, that's we see a lot of our customers do this. Uh, it doesn't have to be a full-blown wood application producing data is what I'm trying to get to. All right, I think that's about time. Thank you, everyone, Thank you for coming. Really appreciate